Thank you for listening to this week's message from New Tribe Church. We hope you are both inspired and encouraged. To stay connected with us throughout your week, be sure to visit our website, download our app, or find us on Facebook and Instagram simply by searching for New Tribe Church. Now, open your hearts to hear and receive all that God has in store for you. In this new season, we're not in a a series of messages, but rather in a season of messages uh, titled Living Empowered, because we believe this, that you as a believer are not supposed to live powerless. Let me just say this. As an unbeliever, as a seeker, you're not designed to live powerless. God has given you the faculties, the mechanics, the DNA to carry the very presence of God. Have you considered that? Right? This is amazing. And so we feel like it's important for us as the church to address this issue of powerlessness in our lives. Now, there's moments where we feel powerless, right? Come on, let's just be honest. But we don't have to live there. Amen, somebody? Like, like we've been called to be empowered. And today we're talking about the power of perspective. Somebody say perspective. perspective. And, and our, our goal today really is to go up, right? Because it's inside of us. It's in our nature to ascend, to go up. You know, I'm looking around today and I'm seeing that we've got our elementary age kids in here with us today, you know, in light of this celebration. And I want to tell you, parents, how many know there's no junior Holy Spirit? He's the same Holy Spirit for every age group. And right now, if you're in here and you're, you're usually over there, I want to tell you right now that you can learn right now your age to live empowered, that God's called you to be empowered. In fact, I just think as adults, there's a lot we can learn about ourselves just looking at children. If you have kids or you've watched kids as you raise them or you've been some places where there's kids, if a kid sees stairs, what do they do? They just go up. Right? They just begin to ascend. And what I'm trying to paint for you is this picture that inside of us, there is a longing, there is a hunger, hunger to go up. So we're going to look at the power of perspective. And by the end of this message, uh, we are going to be standing up together and ascending with Christ and asking him to impart to us the power of perspective. So I hope you're encouraged today. Let's just look at a definition here of perspective. I've got a few today. Here's a definition for perspective. The relative importance of facts and matters from any special point of view. This is actually a really good definition. I'll tell you why. Because it reminds us that perspective is relative. Now, usually when we hear relative, especially where truth is being taught, we get a little nervous because we're like, you know, are you saying like truth is relative? No. But thank God that perspective is relative because it reminds us that perspective can change. Now, how many of you are thankful for that? Because imagine if you were stuck with the same perspective your whole life. But, but the good news is, is that perspective is based on, on the relative import, importance of facts and matters from any special point of view. That means that just a slight adjustment in my point of view can change a bad perspective into a good perspective. Come on, somebody. And then a good perspective can become a great perspective. And an unhealthy perspective can become a healthy perspective. How many are you thankful for that? So I'm glad the perspective is relative. I need my perspective to change. I need my view on the world to be enhanced. If, I'm, if I have tunnel vision, if I just see things one way, how many know that's an unhealthy perspective? I need to allow God to shape my perspective to see the world that he's designed me to see the world. And the truth is, our perspectives tend to change over time. Let's take, let's take food, for example. What we used to see as healthy, we now know because of the importance of facts and matters exposed to us that they are actually unhealthy. Now, I pulled up some of my favorite old health food advertisements. I wanted to share those with you today. Now, every kid in this room, wouldn't you like to wake up to some vitamin donuts? <laughs> now, this is an advertisement. 25 units of vitamin B1, and you get to wash that down with a chocolatey glass of Ovaltine, <laughs> which also has your daily need for vitamins. Parents, how many of you are going to rush out and buy some vitamin donuts today for your children to start their healthy breakfast, right? How about this? This is the sandwich, they said, that you could live on. That's right. You can take this sandwich here, this craft processed cheddar cheese sandwich. Bread and butter supply energy and vitamin A. Tomato adds vitamin C. And you can see here by spreading the Vegemite extract on this right here, you can... <laughs> Am I selling it to you or what? I mean, look at this thing. Okay, how about this one right here? We have to get our hats off to old Ronald McDonald. Now, this is an ad that was given to Australia at some point. More than 55% of your daily protein needs, everybody. Come on, this is your post-workout solution right here, according to this advertisement. How about this one? Mom, if you don't have time to cook, just look at your spam, 
you know, gotta, you got to have your span dandy options here, right? So we got noodles Romanoff. We got calico bean bake. Okay, all right. Let's get that off the screen. All of these. Now, it's funny to us now, but all of these at one time were actually marketed to us as health food. How many are thankful that perspectives can change? All right? The exposure to, the, to a new set of facts or, or new life experiences, okay, especially faith, can dramatically cause a shift in my perspective. It's good that my perspective can change. I need, in 2020, I need my perspective to change. Because I, I know, like here, okay, I can hear someone say, you know, hey, you weren't designed to live powerless. God said you're to live empowered. I can hear all of those things. But if my perspective, if I'm looking at something the other way, I'm hearing it, but it's just going in one ear and right out the other. Let me just expose us to some, some facts, okay, about our lives this morning. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says that God has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has set eternity in the human heart. And no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And here's an example of how an ancient scripture exposes us to and confirms to us a fact that there's a longing in your heart that there has to be more. This is a fact that can shift your perspective. There is an innate fixation on your heart for the eternal things. You know, C.S. Lewis famously said that if one finds himself wondering often, about another world. It's a reminder that they're only visiting this one. There's something inside of you that desires more than what you experience nine to five, 50 hours a week. It just the routine, the mundane. How about this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 12. The apostle says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror but then talking about what's to come we shall see face to face now I know in part but then I shall know fully and this word affirms what most people experience as they grow life is teaching you teaching us that you cannot base what you know only by what you see so, so in one instance, we see the relative importance of facts and matters. And, and, and we've talked about how being exposed to a new sets of facts or matters or life experiences can shift our, 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 our perspective, especially faith. So we see two examples here. One, our heart is fixed on the eternal things. And, and as we grow, it's obvious that we can't just learn based on what we see. Now, I want to make sure I clarify this. Don't mistake this right here as, well, the Bible says, you know, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Has anyone here seen the Jamaican tangelo? It is an ugly piece of fruit. It looks like something that you would see on Dr. Pimple Popper. If you have, if you've, I'm sorry if I just ruined your lunch or your donut, especially if it's cream filled. All right, Nick, keep going. Just keep, God, just, okay. So, the, the, <laughs> pastors will do anything to keep people's attention. All right, so what, what I'm trying to help, help us see is that in this instance, right, sometimes we take for granted the appearance of things. The, the example of this tangelo, for example, it's actually a really delicious fruit. This is what Jesus was pound, trying to pound into his followers' heads. Because we do this. Look what he said in John 7. He said, stop judging by mere appearances. And this is not just about judging people. This is about how you judge or your, what your perspective is on all things in life. You walk into a room and you immediately start making judgments. You give no consideration to the time, the distance, the history, what happened, who's who, what's the background. You don't do that inst instinctively, right? You, you judge by appearance. Jesus came to reverse that because he wanted to cause a shift in your perspective. He said, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So that's the goal, right, of a good, healthy perspective. So how do you judge correctly? How do you discern correctly? How do you, how about this? How do we understand the day and times correctly? I mean, even if you don't really follow the news and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it's crazy kind of what's going on. Is anyone feeling that? I mean, there's a lot. And it would be easy to lose your perspective and be like, it's the end of the world and we lose all hope. But how many know the good news never stops being good news? I mean, tribulation, like we still preach the gospel, right? Uh, so, so it would be real easy if you were taking everything by appearance to misjudge or misunderstand the times. 
So how do you reconcile by faith, right? The sum total of facts that you've been exposed to and the life experience that you've had. How do you, how do you reconcile all that? Here's how. And that's what we're going to look at the rest of this message. Here's how you do it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4. So we fix, somebody say fix. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what, what on is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, this is a powerful perspective. Would you agree? The idea of looking beyond what's just right in front of me. So Jesus, right, would you say he had a powerful perspective? I would hope so. Come on, somebody. Right? And here's the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, which is the highest purchased and read book on the planet. I would say this is a powerful and healthy perspective from someone who has inspired, literally, nations. This is a good perspective to fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but what is on unseen. Why? Because just as we've looked at and examined the fact, eternity is on your heart. You know you can't just judge things by what you see. As you get older, you learn this because you realize you've made some misjudgments in your, in your lifetime. This is a powerful perspective. And here's what I'm trying to get down to. This is just one main point of this entire message is this is that great perspective exists in those who have disciplined themselves to stare at the vision and glance at the problem. You might say, well, I, you know, I don't have, you have vision. You have vision for the place that you work. You have vision for how you want to parent. You have vision for relationships, the kind of friends you want to be the kind of friends that you're looking for, the things that you value. You, you may not walk around writing it down on paper and saying you have vision, but you do have vision. There is a way in which you see and view the world, and that is your vision. But you know, there's going to be problems, there's going to be issues that could cause us to leave or lose our perspective. This church has a vision, right? Like, here's a good example. So our church has a vision. Like, we want to be a church that this is what we focus on, right? We want to build relationships that last. First, right, we want to help people build a relationship with God. How many know that's a lasting relationship? And help God build, and help people build a relationship with one another. And then to encourage, to encourage the kind of faith that moves mountains in the life of others. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you don't have the faith to move a mountain, which is why it's so important to get around some other people who may have the faith that day to do so. And so it's this idea, it's this vision. And let's say that you come to a church like New Tribe and you're like, you buy into this vision and you start making a new friend, a couple of new friends. You start growing in your relationship with God and, and you experience the faithfulness of God in your life and some mountains are moved, but then some trials come, some troubles come. You realize that the personality of someone who you befriended is not actually how you thought they were or maybe their humanness just begins to shine and you're like, yeah, I'm not sure I'm really, uh, I'm not sure I'm really down with the vision. <laughs> Come on. Are there any dads in here who've ever coached T-ball? Okay. However that works right there, that's for you. Yeah, I signed up to do that one year. And after the first game, I was like, I don't think I got any vision for this thing, right? Like, I don't. But I endured, right? I mean, but I kept going. Like, parents are mad at me. Like, kids are picking their noses and, you know, pulling their pants down in the middle of the field. Like, hey, no, no, we don't do that. Hey, what are we doing? Like, what's, what's happening here? Like, this is this chaos. Look, here's a picture I'm trying to get. Like, sometimes you buy into a right vision, but then you experience the hu hu humanness of others or, or troubles or, or, or trials. And then you begin to question. I mean... Here's what I want you to get. Sometimes, sometimes we just need to stop and think about what is it that I'm actually looking at and why am I looking at this thing that way? I want to give you a challenge this week here that will help you hopefully learn to stare at the vision and glance at the problem. I want to challenge you for the rest of this month. Here's, here's the challenge, but I want to do this by casting some vision. I want to challenge you, all of us, to experience a deeper level of intimacy with God in the month of January. How many of you would accept that challenge? Okay, I'll accept that challenge. So we're going to do that together. That's the challenge. But, but here's how we're going to discipline ourselves, right, to stare at the vision and glance at the problem. What's the vision? 
to grow in a deeper level of intimacy with God in the month of January. That's the vision. Well, how are we going to do there? How are we going to discipline ourselves to stare at this vision? And we're going to experience together fasting over the next three weeks. Some of you are already fasting. This isn't intermittent fasting. What's the goal of fasting? The goal of fasting is to experience a new level of intimacy with God. This week, we're going to look at doing a sugar fast. And next week, as a church, we're going to do a media fast. Uh-oh. And then we're going to do like a vegetable only fast, like towards the end and water, vegetable and water only. All right. So, but why, why do we do these kind of things? How about this? If you want to gain a new perspective, and this is just true in all life, give up something you love for something you love more. Right? I want to, I want to just take a, I'm going to take a guess here. I'm going to say that probably 90% of the room in here, you love God. But you also love eating out, or you love your, your Netflix, or your Hulu. Or, yeah, so a kid back there was like, yes, please don't take that away, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to gain new perspective, give up something you love for something you love more. Now, this week we're going to, beginning tomorrow, here's the challenge. I want you to join us as a church on a sugar fast. What does that mean? It means no sweets, right? We're going to fast from all sweets. And I can already tell you that for me, this is going to create a problem. Okay? Why? Because I love sugar and high fructose corn syrup. I'm not afraid to admit that. I love sweets. But my vision, come on, I just, this is a picture. My vision is to grow in a deeper level of intimacy with God. The problem is, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up something I love, which is the sugar over here, for something I love more, which is God. But the problem is, is that my body's going to be mad at me for giving up sugar. And I'm probably going to get a headache and I'm, I'm going to get irritable. But because I have vision, that's how I'm going to accomplish experiencing another level of intimacy with God. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stare at the vision and glance at the problem. I'm going to stare at my, my, my want, my desire to grow in a deeper level of intimacy with God. And I'm going to glance at the hunger pains, glance at the headaches, and glance at the desire to fill my noggin with things that I don't really need. In other words, I'm not going to stare at the food, right? I'm going to stare at growing in a deeper level of intimacy with God. Come on, who's with me with that challenge, right? So that's, that's the whole idea. And this is just one example. This is true in all areas of life. You know, Jesus said things to his disciples that just made them stop and think. He had been ministering all day one time in the Gospels, and they saw him, and they said, Jesus... What, he's on fire, right? He's growing in his relationship with God. He's on fire for the things of God. And when Jesus was in the flesh, we know Jesus was God, but he was in the flesh, he was for God. And he's on fire, he's been doing things for God, and his disciples see him and they say, hey, Jesus, aren't you hungry? Don't you want to get something to eat? And he looks at them and he says, I have food that you do not know of. What's he doing in that situation? He's not staring at the problem which is hunger, which is desire, which is all these things. He has vision. He's staring at the vision, and he's glancing at the problem. Well, well, let's talk about problems just for a minute here. Anybody here got problems? <laughs> Come on, right? Like trials and tribulations. Like you talk about a series like, or a season. We're living in power last week, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? This week, like the power of perspective. But you're like, yeah, I got problems, <laughs> I got issues, right? And so to stare at the vision is not to deny the problem. It's just I'm not staring at it anymore. I'm focused on something else. But how about this? The troubles, the problems. What if, would it change your perspective today if I could convince you that the troubles you have actually can advance you? Would that change your perspective? Look at this. 2 Corinthians 4, back into verse 17. For our light... And momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Did you just see what I just saw? Your troubles are achieving something for you. Not in what is seen, but what is an unseen. I thought I'd get an amen or something like right about like there, like third row back maybe, like an amen right there. Your troubles, your tribulations, your problems are actually achieving for something 
for you in the background when you continue to stare at the vision to look to the eternal things and glance at the problem. I'm trusting God. I know this is over here, but I'm trusting God. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to give thanks every day. I'm going to glance at the issue because we all got him, but my eyes are fixed to something higher, a higher calling. I'm going to glance at the problem. I'm going to stare at the vision. And your troubles are achieving something for you. Wait, nobody knows the trouble I know. Yeah, there actually is somebody, Jesus. And when you look to him in your affliction, I'm not making this up. Let this change your perspective. He says that your troubles are working for you behind the scenes. My gosh, if that won't keep you motivated. So our troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. all the other. So it's like, here's life troubles over here weighing me down, but the glory that's being achieved from behind the scene outweighs all of them. So we fix, say fix. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Now this word fix here is from the Greek word skupoton, which is to look at, regard attentively, okay, to stare at. Now it's from this word Scopas, which is a watchman. Here's the definition, or a mark on which to fix the eye. Already you probably hear the sound of the root of our English term scope, right? Like the zoom scope on a rifle to hit the target. So when I ask you a question this morning, what is your scope aimed at? What is your scope fixed on? That's what you'll hit. If it's fixed on eternity, if it's fixed on faith, if it's fixed on God, in spite of all of these other things that are happening around you, eventually you're going to hit what you're aiming at. Look at this, Romans 5, 2 through 5. So what are, what are we supposed to be aiming at? Through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope. Somebody say hope real loud. Because because it says we rejoice in hope. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We're looking for something greater, something beyond what I'm experiencing. I'm not going to let nine to five drag me down the bills, the responsibilities. I'm going to manage and steward those things well, but I'm going to keep myself and my family focused on what God has called me to, the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And now you know a little bit more. You actually know that trouble's achieving something for you behind the scenes. And this endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Somebody say hope again. And this hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Here's something I want you to see. If you want to keep a healthy perspective, keep your scope on hope. That is what you're looking at. That is what you're aimed at when everything else seems to be falling apart. And it's not in vain. And what does the word say? It will not put you to shame. This is God calling you to a challenge. A, I know you're going to have suffering. I know you're going to have trials. I know there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be problems, relational problems, work problems, all kinds of problems. But I want you to know in those times, I'm challenging you. If you hope in me, it will not put you to shame. That's a challenge from God. And so you keep your scope fixed on that. Now, I want to do something for you today because uh, you may or may not know this, but every person has a dominant eye and a non-dominant eye. Now, if you shoot weapons, you already know all this kind of stuff, but this may be foreign to some of you, right? Everyone has a dominant eye or one eye that works a little harder than the other. So I need you all to hold your hands up in front of you just like this, if you would, and, and do something like this. This is not Luminati, all right? <laughs> now, keep your hands fixed just like this. I want you to find something in the room. Find an object. It could be up high, low. It could be the cross. And you look at that object through your view with both eyes. Now, close your left eye. It should still be there for most. Close your right eye. For most of you, it's probably going to disappear. When you see an object with both eyes through this shape, and you close one eye and it remains, that's your dominant eye. But you notice if you close one eye, that object will disappear. How many of you just experienced this phenomenon right now, right? You just experienced your dominant eye. Listen, here's what I'm trying to get at. It's not that we can't see, right? It's not that we don't have vision. We've already talked about that. We have vision for all kinds of things in life. But I believe one of the problems is, is that we take aim, we close the wrong eye, it disappears, and we wonder what happened. 
Oftentimes we have the right vision, but the wrong perspective. And this is a real problem, right? This is a real problem for those who've been called to hope. Because you're like, yeah, I know what the scriptures say. I know it says this and that, whatever. But, you know, life's teaching me something different. No, 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 no. It's just that you're using the wrong eye. Is you do have vision, but you're closing the wrong eye. You're not focused on the right thing. Your scope isn't on hope. You've got the right vision, but the wrong perspective. Let's just, let's get into something real practical here and move on. Let's just say it's 2020. I want to get in the best shape of my life. Anybody with me? I, I mean, I turned 40 this year. Woo, 40. 40's the new 20. Come on, something. I'm just kidding. That's what people are saying. I don't know. Anyways, I want to get in the best, <laughs> I want to get in the best shape of my life. I really do. Now, that's a good perspective. Would you agree? But then let's say that I, I start going around saying, oh, you know what? I actually, I want to look just like him, right? Or well, if I were my wife, I'd say, I want to look just like her. I want to clarify that. And I start, now that's a poor perspective. Why? Because now the scope has shifted from hitting a personal goal to comparison with the person. This is what we do. We have the right vision, but the wrong perspective. So what happens is I had this I had amazing perspective getting the best shape of my life, but then I shifted my scope. Oh, I wanted to be just like them, just like this guy. Apply this to faith or to anything in life, right? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more in sales this year. You know, I, I don't know what it is for you. I, I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better mother. I'm going to do this better, do that better. I'm going to achieve more in this area. And you start setting these personal goals, which is a great perspective, but then you see somebody else doing it better than you, and you shift your scope and go, ooh, well, if I could just do more like what they're doing, that'd be great. And now the sudden you have the wrong perspective you start out with great vision so here's what happens you miscalculate the distance it takes to get where you want to be and at the same time you discredit your own progress and now suddenly you lose hope is this preaching anybody today this is the power of perspective one last definition as we get get ready to land the plane here perspective the effect of distance upon the appearance of objects by means of which the eye judges spatial relations. Okay, let me just break that down for you in my own understanding. So I had a friend recently come up to me and he said, hey, you know, I was, I was watching that NASA channel. Anyone here know the NASA channel? It's one, it's like, you know, the one with the satellite, it's orbiting over the earth and you just like, you like see the earth and it's got like this ambient music in the background. He was like, I'm, I'm watching the NASA channel. I didn't judge him. I was like, carry on. <laughs> Great channel right now. And he's like, you know, I was watching the NASA, NASA channel and just watching that thing orbit the earth. He said, you know what? The funny thing is, I couldn't see myself down there. And he said, you know, that just gave me such a different view on life. Now, how many know that's great perspective? I was like, I can appreciate that. It would seem silly for someone watching the NASA channel to get upset because they couldn't see themselves. <laughs> like, I don't like watching this channel because it kind of makes me feel overlooked, right? going around, everything's big, but where am I, right? Where am I in the picture? Can I tell you it's not the end of the world to know that you're not the center of it? <laughs> and it would be silly for us to think that way, but sometimes, sometimes that's what we do. And, and look, and the devil kind of plays this little trick on us like, oh, all these bigger vision, these things people are talking about, calling you up, all this, you're just overlooked. They don't notice you. I want you to see this. Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. This is what happens when you step into a relationship with Jesus. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages, he might show you something. In, in order that in the coming days, okay, you stepped into a relationship with Jesus. You said, this is what I want to do. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to put my hope in the glory of God. This is what I'm going to do. And troubles are going to come, and the devil's going to smack you around, and you're going to face tribulation and trials, and life's going to get difficult. But in those times, you remember where you're seated and who you're seated with, because it's in those moments where Jesus is going to show you the incomparable riches of his kindness towards you. Christ Jesus. And this is a perspective that we can have. Look, here's what I'm trying to say. When God is calling you up to see the bigger picture, it's not to make you feel overlooked, but to show you that you will overcome. 
It's, it's, he's not calling you up and out of the things that you're doing right now and overlook, well, God's just overlooking my life and God's overlooking the trials and God's overlooking the problems and, and my brother and sister over here who are praying for me and tell me just to have hope and to believe and to have faith and to fast and to pray. They're just overlooking my problems. No, they're pointing you to a bigger vision where you are seated in heaven with Christ Jesus and he is about to show you the incomparable riches of his love towards you. Somebody say perspective. That's our goal today to go up. All right, we're done. Amen, everybody. <laughs> hey, let's stand together. And don't move around too much. In fact, I want you to do this. Will you close your eyes? Just close your eyes with me. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to trust me here. Actually, better than that, I want you to trust God. I want you to open your hands like this towards heaven. Would you do that? Just, just both hands, palms facing forward. Come on, just trust God on this, man. Get your hands out of your pocket like you're in church. Like surely you thought something spiritual was going to happen. God's about to drop something on you right now. You close your eyes. Close out the distractions. And right now, I want you to picture in your mind every problem of your life. Every trial. Every affliction. Everything that worries you. Here you are, you're standing with your hands open, and maybe you're, you're just knee up in trouble, man. Maybe it's up to your neck. You feel buried in it. And just right there in your mind's eye, as you feel all this trouble and this affliction around you, I want you to, in your mind's eye, to look towards heaven. And you begin to see a throne, right? You've heard about this throne. There's someone clothed in white, looks like the Son of Man. He's so glorious, you can't quite make out who it is, what he looks like, but you know it's God. And here you are neck deep in all your trouble, but you're looking up. And he looks down upon your situation and he says, hey, come up here. Your feet begin to leave the ground. You rise above your home, your workplace, your city, your state. You can see that you're ascending, you're going higher. Now you're above your nation in the atmosphere up into the stratosphere. Now you've passed through first, second, and third heavens. And you find yourself still there with your hands open. And now you are seated with God and he begins to show you the incomparable riches of his grace toward every one of those problems and afflictions keep your hands open this is important for illustration you're still staying there with your hands open he's talking to you and he says to you I want you to take a good look I'm going to show you the incomparable riches of my grace over all of these things and they start to disappear. And then he points towards a gate. And though you're standing with him, you see yourself approaching that gate. Your hands are open like they are right now. But you see yourself approaching that gate and your arms and your hands are filled with something different than problems. They look like crowns. There's so many of them. You can't count them. They look like trophies or crowns. And you approach the gate. The gate opens up. You enter in. And as you're watching this happen across the distance, sitting next to God, he says, hey, look down in your hands. And you see what you saw across the distance. Your hands are filled with trophies and with crowns. And he says to you, these are the victories I have planned for you. These are the battles I have won for you. And you lay him at his feet whispers to you I want to impart to you the power of perspective I want you to hear one day well done good and faithful servant I want you to know in the midst of your problems I want you to see my grace I want you to know I can transform your trash into triumph I want you to know I can take your baggage and transform it to blessing. Your mishaps for my majesty, if you will allow my grace to touch those areas. And he says, now stare at the vision and glance at the problem. Will you receive this today as I pray over you with your hands open? Listen, problems you face are going to be inevitable But the perspective that Jesus wants you to leave here today with is that they are temporary. And if you will keep your eyes fixed upon him in every season, 
he's going to impart to you such powerful perspective that when others are staring at the issues, you will be so fixed on this vision that you will find victory after victory. He will move you from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Jesus, I just pray over your church right now, over your people right now, an impartation of your presence and power, that 2020 would be a year of such great perspective, that everyone in this room right now would turn their scope, that they would fix it on hope, that they would be walking towards you victoriously, even in the midst of life.